sorry. Okay, thank you. So in our today's class, first we're gonna review the rheumatic fever, yeah? Yeah. And then we start with the cardiac cycle and then we will start with our today's topic, which is about the infective endocarditis, yes? Okay. So I would like to hear from you about the review of the rheumatic fever. Can you quickly review it? <laughs> You are recording me and testing me. <laughs> yes, so do you want me to review the rheumatic fever? No, no. Um, um, yeah. So yesterday we studied about the rheumatic fever and we said that the pathogen causing rheumatic fever is group A streptococcus beta hemolyticus. And the pathogenesis mm -hmm of this rheumatic fever was actually a type two hypersensitivity reaction, which is also called molecular mimicry. And in that class, we discussed that there is, uh, when the streptococcus bacteria enter into our body, then on the surface of the streptococcus bacteria, there is M antigen. And our immune system recognizes this M antigen and produce antibodies against this M antigen of streptococcus bacteria. Now what really yeah. happens that these antibodies produced by our immune system, they react against the M antigen and make the immune complexes, which are later on destroyed by the immune system. But in some patient, in some individuals, what really happens is this these antibodies cross-react against our own tissues, especially the N-acetyl glucosamine uh, proteins, which is present on the different tissues in our body. Like for example, when these immune uh, antibodies cross-react against the heart tissues, they can produce endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. When they react against the nervous tissue, they produce Sydenham chorea, react against the joints and cause polyarthritis. And then they react against the skin and then produce subcutaneous nodules. So in this, we said that streptococcus, uh, when it enters into our body, initially the, it causes sore throat. And if we uh, treat the sore throat within 90 days with antibiotic like amoxicillin, then the streptococcus get treated and we don't have any reaction, okay? But if there, if there is a recurring sore throat like, and you don't get to treat it, then maybe after three weeks, the patient start developing the arthritis symptoms, which are all around almost 60 to 70% of the cases of streptococcus infections or rheumatic fever. Then after five weeks, the patient developed carditis symptoms, which are around 50 to 75% of the cases. Then maybe the late features, if the patient is having recurrent streptococcus infections, maybe after six months, the patient developed chorea. And thank God that is very few, like two to 3%. But the very late features appear like skin features, like subcutaneous nodules, okay? Then yeah. we studied that the clinical feature, first of all, there is a carditis symptoms. So in the carditis, the patient can have pericarditis, myocarditis, and endocarditis. So in the pericarditis, the patient uh, ECG manifestations will be concave ST elevation, which can be seen in the picture diagram, right? Then yeah. the myocarditis, if the myocarditis gets uh, affected by the immune complex, then the patient develops acute congestive heart failure. And if the patient develops acute congestive heart failure, we said that we could treat you with LMNOP therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And L stands for Lasix, M stands for morphine, N stands for nitroglycerin or nitroglycer uh, nitrites, O stands for oxygen, and P stands for proper position, right? Okay, and then if the bacterium involved the endocarditis, then maybe the patient get endocarditis, 
and as the valves of the cardiac tissues are attached with the endocarditis, so we can have uh, mitral regurg and aortic regurg. And we also studied that the mitral regurg is more common than aortic regurg, right? Right. Okay. Uh, and we said that the regurgitation is more common than stenosis. And we also studied that regurgitation is commonly in the younger age group, like five to 14 years of age. But if the endocarditis develops in the older age people, like more than 18 years of age, then maybe the stenosis can be over there. And we said that the mostly, the, the cardiac valves which are involved are mostly of the left side. But if the right-sided cardiac valves are involved, then maybe the mechanism is a li little bit different that right-sided cardiac valves are not directly uh, attacked by the bacteria, but they are indirectly because of the failure of the left ventricle. So if there is a pulmonary valve regard, your tricuspid valve regards, that is because of the left ventricular failure and backflow pressure. Another thing we have studied that, that this, um, because the murmurs, which is there is a pan-systolic murmur. So uh, actually the murmur is of mitral regurg and mitral regurg is mostly the pan-systolic murmur, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Another thing which we have studied yesterday that the bacterium which is present on the surface of the valve is mainly on the anterior and posterior leaflets. But most of the time, the bacterium is present on the commissural end of the valves, right? Where yes. the valves fuse with each other. Yes. This was the whole cardiac component of the uh, rheumatic fever. Then we studied yes. that the, 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 the arthritis components is that the, these immune complexes or the rheumatic fever mainly involve the large joints, like knee, ankle joint and elbow joint. And mostly multiple joints are involved, like that's why it is called polyarthritis. And another nature of this arthritis is that it's migratory. So sometimes the patient complain one joint, then another joint, then another joint, right? So it's moving. So that's why it is called migratory polyarthritis. And for the treatment of this migratory polyarthritis, mostly we use aspirin. But if the patient is having stomach irritability with the aspirin, we give the nephroxin to these patients. Right. And the third clinical manifestation of the rheumatic fever we studied that this is Sydenham chorea. And the Sydenham chorea is involuntary, purposeless movements uh, in the body. Um, I mean, in the hands or in the feet or in the head or in the uh, tongue, right? And that's because the, the rheumatic fever damage the caudate nucleus. And the main function of the caudate nucleus is the coordination of the movement. And if the yeah. coordination of the movement is not there, then maybe the purposeless uh, movements are there. That is the uh, main clinical manifestation of pseudonym for you. Okay. And that is more common in female than males, right? And the last but not the least manifestation we studied yesterday about is that of skin, right? Yeah. And in that we said that skin, in the skin, this rheumatic fever produces subcutaneous nodules, mainly in the hand and in occiput region. And this also yeah. produces erythema marginatum, which are pink macule with central clearing appear central clearing, which appear and disappear with the time. Yes. Yeah. So these four were the clinical manifestations of the rheumatic fever, carditis, arthritis, and acidonym and skin manifestations, right? Mm -hmm. And yesterday we also studied about the Jones criteria for the diagnosis yes. of uh, rheumatic fever. And the Jones criteria was telling us that there is a major criteria and the minor criteria. So the main major criteria was mainly developed uh, depending on the clinical manifestation of the patients, while the minor criteria was mainly depending on the uh, lab's findings. So in the major criteria, number one was carditis. Number two was polyarthritis. 
Number three was chorea. Number four was erythema marginatum. And number five was subcutaneous nodules. While on the minor criteria side, we have studied that number one is fever, which is more than 38.5 degrees centigrade. And then raised ESR, more than 60 mm, and CRP, more than three. And prolonged fear means first degree heart block. So dramatic heart fear patients can also have first degree heart block, which is a minor criteria. And arthralgia, the pain in the multiple joints. So they said that in the Jones criteria, if you have the two major plus two major findings, then the Jones criteria is positive and you can diagnose rheumatic fever. But if the two major findings are not there, then if the one major plus two minors are out there, then you can also diagnose the uh, rheumatic fever. And to exclude other diseases, we have also studied that we can do the CBC. ECG, ECO, and streptococcal serology. Yesterday, doctor, um, you have asked me a question that if, uh, if the, yesterday you asked me that if the, how do we know that whether uh, the sore throat is because of streptococcus bacteria or something else? So, uh, we have seen that anti-streptolysin and anti-DNAs B are the serology, streptococcus serology, with which we can confirm that whether this sore throat is because of um, streptococcus bacteria or something else, right? Yeah. And in the later section, we also studied the treatment of acute rheumatic fever, which was primary prevention with amoxicillin or penicillin, and we have to start the treatment within nine days of infection. Then for the pain component, we have to give the aspirin or naproxen. And we can also give the steroids, but the role is controversial. Steroid role is controversial, but they said that if there is a pericarditis, steroids are very helpful or useful, okay? And acute congestive heart failure, we studied that we can use LMNOP therapy, which we have discussed before, like lessix, morphine, nitrase, oxygen, and proper position. And for the chorea, we can have carbamazepine or valproate, which are more effective than haloperidol. Okay. And if you have given all the treatment to this rheumatic heart patient, and still the patient is not recovering, then you will give, you will give IV immunoglobulin which is called passive immunity. So you directly kill the bacteria with the pre-planned pre or pre-made, uh, ready-made uh, antibodies. Yes. So this was all about the acute rheumatic fever. Thank you. Okay, so now we are gonna record, the, uh, we are gonna review the cardiac cycle and Dr. Madia is gonna review with that. So the cardiac cycle has five phases. Um, the first one is isovolumetric relaxation. And it starts with the ventricle being in diastole, the aortic and pulmonary valve close, and you hear S2. The mitral and tricuspid valves are not open yet. So the heart is basically acting as a closed chamber. There's no change in volume because no blood is coming in or out. Um, then there's the ventricle filling phase. Over here, the mitral and the tricuspid valve open, and this is where 80% of the ventricular filling happens. It's called passive filling. The atrium are not contracting yet, and the blood is coming without force into the ventricle. And we have the atrial contraction phase, which starts with um, forceful atrial contraction called the atrial kick. This basically pushes out um, that from the atrium and it results in 20% of ventricular filling. And over here, the aortic and pulmonary valve are still closed, but at the mitral and tricuspid valve are open. And we have isovolumetric or isovolumic contraction. This starts with the ventricular contraction. The aortic and pulmonary valves are closed. And now the mitral and tricuspid valve also closes. And you hear S1. 
and the heart is contracting, but it's still a closed chamber. And then you have the ventricular ejection phase where the blood starts going out of the ventricle and um, you have the aortic and the pulmonary valve open, uh, the mitral and tricuspid valve are still closed and there's ejection of blood out of the ventricle. That's great, Dr. Mendy. And we have said that 80% uh, of the cardiac cycle is mainly consists of diastole. Yes. And 20% is consists of systole, right? Yes. Yeah, that's great. So 